From Vernissage Health, this is Built to Lead, a show where we talk to emerging and established leaders from all levels within the healthcare sector in the hope of breaking boundaries, inspiring hope, and redirecting views on what the landscape of healthcare leadership is and can be. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, as we officially launched the Built to Lead podcast. We're so excited to have over 300 registrants and we have about 60 people with us right now today. And we're excited to have this conversation with Matt Anderson and Camille Orridge. My name is Matthew Goldburn. I'm a recent IHPME Master of, of Health Administration student. Um, I truly believe leadership is one of the key um, tools to unlocking one's potential to transform the health system. And I hope that you will learn just as much as I have throughout these conversations that we had within this first season of Built to Lead from self-doubt to confidence, where we explore overcoming imposter syndrome to becoming our best version of self. And I'm be moderating today's conversation with our illustrious guest. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Sarah. Thank you, Matthew. Um, it's such a pleasure to have this event today. Uh, we're both looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, my name is Sarah Sawaya, um, and I'm a current Master of Health Informatics student here at the IHPME, um, and I've also been a co-host of the Built to Lead podcast for this season. Um, it's been a really amazing experience getting to have conversations with some great healthcare leaders in our community, um, and today is going to be extra special with two really great guests, so we're looking forward to it. And just um, thank you, Sarah, for that. Uh, we're just going to be starting on time, so as people roll in, um, just welcome, introduce yourself, uh, because we have a lot packed for this hour, and we want to make sure we get to it. This is actually a live recording for our podcast, and I hope that many of you have been able to listen to our trailer and introductory episode, just to get a better understanding of what Built to Lead really is. And Built to Lead, the Health Leaders of Tomorrow podcast, is a student directive initiative that explores leadership concepts and discusses the challenges young youth leaders face. So this is a companion initiative with Vernissage Health, an open dialogue series where established and emerging leaders come together to explore leadership and health system transformation. And in this first season of the podcast, Sarah and I had a chance to speak to faculty, students, recent alumni, established leaders, and now senior established leaders to uncover what it takes to be a great leader in today's health system. And the live recording today will be with Matt and Camille, and this is going to be our fifth episode and the final one of this season. So on that note, uh, this is available everywhere now, wherever you stream. So just search Built to Lead Health Leaders of Tomorrow and just please subscribe and leave a review. Any and all feedback are welcome. And just a special uh, thank you to our sponsors because none of this will be possible without them. So the IHPME and the Dalalana School of Public Health uh, together alongside with the Associated Medical Services. So we'd like to thank uh, especially Gail Peach and Dean Stanley Brown, who are in attendance today for their support and much appreciation. Thanks, Matt, Matthew, for that introduction. Um, so now let me introduce our two very special guests, uh, both of which are actually IHPME alumni. So Camille Orridge is a passionate advocate for social change and health equity. She has held multiple senior leadership positions, including CEO, of Toronto CCAC and Toronto Central Lynn. In addition to her current role as senior fellow with the Wellesley Institute, Camille is an active member of the community and frequently provides mentorship to emerging leaders. Joining her in conversation today uh, is Matt Anderson. Matt is known to be a trusted, innovative and dynamic leader who has continuously contributed to improving healthcare across Ontario. He has also held many uh, senior leadership positions, including CEO of William Osler Health System and Lake Ridge Health. And more recently, as many of you know, Matt has been appointed President and CEO of Ontario Health, the new provincial healthcare agency, where he's focused on creating a patient-centered and connected healthcare system. And I could go on about both of our guests, but they did ask me to keep it brief, so I'll keep it to that. Um, Matt and Camille are also colleagues and longtime friends, so I know that today's conversation is really going to be amazing with both of them. And just a few more notes before we continue. 
Uh, to everyone who's listening, you may have noticed that your cameras and audio have been disabled for the duration of the conversation, but we definitely want to hear from you because we're going to be having a Q&A session at the end. So please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to ask any questions throughout the duration of the conversation, and we'll be sure to get to as many as we can during the Q&A. And last but not least, um, this episode is a live recording for the Built to Lead podcast, um, so that will be made available on October 8th. And now let's hear from our guests. So Matthew, I'll pass it on to you. And thank Great, you. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, which Matthew? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm Matt. <laughs> we'll, 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 yeah, we'll go I with Matthew. And I Matt. wanted to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go with Matthew and Matt, just uh, the confusion a little bit. So um, just thank you everyone again for joining us. Everyone that's coming in um, as again, as I said, just share where you're from um, as you're coming in and just as you join the conversation, just listen and learn. And just Vernissage Health and this Built to Lead podcast is about having real and relevant, relevant open conversation. Um, and just opening up, we're going to be talking about some issues that are pertinent today. And especially just for me, talking for myself as a young Black emerging leader, it has it's been somewhat encouraging to see the plight of people of color now being brought to the limelight. And especially now as we're trying to tackle these issues of racism in society and the healthcare system. Uh, but especially for me, I can speak on my behalf, is just pursuing a healthcare, um, a career, sorry, in healthcare has definitely been a challenge. So Camille, I'll just start with you. Um, in your recent 2020 Black Experiences in Healthcare Symposium keynote, you shared a story about the lack of health professionals in higher positions. And as someone who came here in the late 1960s from Jamaica, I imagine the climate wasn't as progressive as today, uh, but you found a way to establish yourself. So as a woman of color working in healthcare, can you just share any experience of racial inequalities early in your career and how did this affect your leadership experiences? So Matthew, that's a fairly difficult question because when you've lived a life experiencing racism, trying to pick out one or two episodes mm -hmm. is uh, not as easy. However, um, I just want to also just step back a little because when we talk about leadership in healthcare, we often associate that with titles. And I just want to say leadership and titles are not the same. You can be a leader in all walks of life, all positions, etc. So I, you know, I just want to make sure we um, not necessarily confuse the two at all times during the conversations. Um, so I'll pick. Um, two that for me was uh, um, significant in my life. One was um, 1968 when I was a ward maid in a hospital and applied for a job as a ward clerk and was told by the human resources that um, as a black woman I could not work as a ward clerk. And uh, that had a profound impact because I looked around and I saw a lot of people that I thought I was smarter than having those jobs. And then that kind of made me determined that uh, I liked healthcare, going to be in healthcare, it was a pensionable job. When you're a new immigrant in the 60s, we all went for pensionable jobs. <laughs> and that kind of drove me on. Another one was about 1983, when I was a manager in an acute care hospital and, was, and a job as director came up and I went and spoke to the CEO and, you know, talking about the job and I was told I wasn't a fit um, for the team in the hospital. It wasn't about competence, it wasn't about ability and over the years it clearly wasn't about that. And that made me rethink my role in healthcare and I went from acute to community because I it was closer to what my own values but I also at that time thought why am I going to struggle uphill any further in this sector um, because not being a fit then I just knew it was not going to happen I would not encourage young people today to take that attitude <laughs> I think the world has changed somewhat and it may not be easy, but those were the two um, events that I felt was profound. The difference it made for me was a, a commitment that any room I entered, and you know, in this 80s, 90s, there were not a lot of black leaders, certainly not a lot of black women, 
but my personal commitment was any room I entered as the only black, when I left the room, there should be more than one black person in that room. So that was a, and that, those experiences kind of impacted me that way, that I thought the only way to change the system is to have more of us in the system. And so that was the impact it had. No, those are very uh, encouraging stories. And just you talk about that uphill battle. And even for me, when I was a teenager, um, I had a dream of opening a retirement home for my parents uh, because they just didn't want to go into the ones that we were always visiting our grand aunts. So that was always my dream. And that's pretty much how my healthcare like career started. But it was kind of my dream was kind of shaken a bit because personally, as a young black male, I didn't see a lot of, as you were saying, health leaders or health black leaders in different positions. So I didn't really have any examples uh, growing up. So it was pretty much I'm going into a desert trying to figure things out on my own. And I actually got to speak with what I thought was rare, like a black health leader who was running their own retirement home. And I actually got to spoke, speak with them in terms of like just trying to get advice when I was a teenager or so. And they basically told me my dreams were shaking. They basically told me it's going to be impossible. You're, entering, you're trying to enter a white boys club. So that was, that was kind of discouraging, but luckily I persisted. And luckily now, even today, we are seeing some of that progress and we're seeing people trying to make that change. But even as we talk about equity and equality, I don't want to leave you out, Matt. So can you just both chime in on like, how do we navigate these racial inequalities that we see in healthcare today? So you guys could just chime in. Maybe I'll make a few comments. Uh, and thank you, Matthew. And always uh, great to be with Camille. And thank you, Sarah and Elisa and all the people who have organized all this. And, and for those of you who have joined us today, um, uh, I'll make maybe a few comments. One is, is that um, when I, I think about uh, race, racial inequality in the healthcare system, uh, there's some places where I think it's, it's uh, stunningly obvious um, and some where it's not quite as obvious. Um, and frankly, where it's not quite as obvious is where I worry that that's where it's actually more insidious. Um, where it's stunningly obvious is what, what Matthew has touched on and Camille has touched on. And uh, I have known Camille for longer than probably either of us want to say exactly how long we've known each other. Um, I, I will only say that my 17 year old daughter, uh, we joke that she holds the spirit of Camille in her. Um, so I've known Camille for at least those 17 years. The, uh, one of the things that Camille talked to me about very early on, and it was a really profound time for me, was she spoke to me about, she encouraged me to go, I will we'll leave the name of the organizations out, but she encouraged me to go onto the websites of the following organizations and tell me if the board members of those organizations reflect the communities that they serve. Um, and of course they do not. Uh, and to this day, I think it's maybe better, um, but, but does not. Um, the same with leadership. Um, and if you look at leadership teams, do the leadership teams reflect the communities that they serve, um, and and they do not. And, and and Camille, you know, one of the most important things that uh, she said in there is reflect. Um, Camille didn't tell me that I need to go and make sure I've got three of these, two of those, one of these, and one and a half of that. Um, but reflect, reflect the community. Does it reflect the community? Um, and uh, I would say that there's where you've got some obvious uh, racial inequalities that need to be addressed. In the, the, the ones that are more subtle, um, and uh, Camille actually showed me one of these as well, but, but I've come to learn them, and I see them even today. Um, and that is um, on how we do reporting. Um, when we look at our reporting, uh, and this is particularly a challenge uh, for me in the organization I'm in now, um, because it's a provincial agency. And a provincial agency, that means that most of our data uh, and reporting all gets rolled up. Um, and when you get rolled up information like that, it's very difficult to understand what's going on. And, you know, a, a great uh, and telling story was from a number of years ago, uh, Camille was at the CCC and I was at the Lynn, and we were doing an initiative to look at bringing down the wait times. I think it was for our, our orthopedics procedures. I can't remember exactly which wait times it was, but at any rate, um, we had made this big investment and we had shown that the wait times had come down in the city of Toronto. Uh, Camille encouraged me to run that data by postal code. Um, and when we ran it by postal code, we saw that the wait times had come down dramatically in the uh, higher uh, socioeconomic postal codes and had actually gone up in the lower socioeconomic postal codes. When you rolled it up to the Toronto level, you would never see that. Um, it was all buried inside there. 
Um, so these are some of the challenges and where, where that particular second example comes into play is we make, we make a lot of plans off of those reports. Um, and we decide where resources are gonna go and what investments are going to be made. And so when you miss those important elements, you're missing a, a huge part of the picture as we do all of this. Um, and there'd be examples of that happening right now. I'm part of the COVID command table and I'll tell you that it happens in, even as we prepare for COVID, um, which we know is a disease uh, that, although uh, it doesn't play favorites, uh, it certainly hits certain populations a whole lot harder than it does others. But we still struggle, even though we know that, to understand where do we, how do we address uh, some of those challenges. Uh, certainly, when I work in hospitals, uh, uh, when I look at how people are treated, how we approach care um, throughout the organization, and you know, the, the, where this is again a huge challenge is that many of the people that I'm talking about are very good people. They don't even see that we have built in certain certain protocols and judgments and where we put people, even when they come in the door, where we put them into the emergency room, where we resituate people um, becomes a, a, a big uh, element to, to what's happening. So these are big issues um, and challenges before us. But I want to say this as well, um, and just to echo what Camille said earlier about um, uh, committing to be part of it and committing to move forward. If Camille, you know, Camille said back in 1983, she said just now that she thought about whether or not she could continue to push. Imagine if she didn't, then much of what I've just described to you was illuminated to me by Camille. If Camille hadn't pushed and hadn't been there, Camille and I, you know, maybe would never have met. And now, although Camille isn't the CEO of Ontario Health, I am. But a lot of my beliefs, my, my energy, my understanding has been formed by Camille. So it's not just what Camille did and how she pushed forward, but how she's influenced others as we move forward and maybe can use our positions to try to push forward on this agenda, um, which makes it so important for people to see you can't give up. We have to keep pushing forward. I'll stop there and hand it over to Camille. Well, the, a lot of agencies and people in in healthcare have paid attention to equity and diversity. And so almost everywhere you go, you'll see the language, people will talk about it. What they haven't done or we haven't done, even at the universities and stuff, people will look out in a room and they say we've achieved diversity. But in truth, they haven't. Because what they will see is they'll see some brown faces, they'll see some Asian faces, and then they say, we've achieved diversity. What they haven't looked at is, is a, what about black faces? What about indigenous faces? And yet when we look at health outcomes, black and indigenous are at the, are the worst health outcomes. So there's a fair bit of more work to do um, in terms of actually achieving equity. And I don't think it's just the healthcare system as it is that do not want to necessarily hire black or indigenous people. We have to look at the pipeline. We have to look at the systemic things that happen to our kids in the school system, from childcare to the school system. And even when they go through the school system like you, Matthew, and make it, to then get into the universities is an uphill battle. And then once you get through that, getting a job and <laughs> is another uphill battle. So we have to look at the pipeline and put things in place to ensure people are able to move from one sector to the other and uh, mentoring and guidance and support. <clears throat> because we see, for example, in the indigenous community, Cancer Care Ontario have done a great work around partnering with the indigenous community. Staff come in, they don't stay. It's not safe. The number of comments that they have to live with, put up with mean, Eventually, they figure we can't cope and they leave. So those are all the different pieces of, uh, um, that we have to look at. It's not just the leadership and the visibility, which is important, but you know, how do we get to high school to ensure that kids in high school know physiotherapy exists, occupational therapy exists, <laughs> you know, all the various technicals. The, most of the guidance counselors say doctor and nurse, they look at you, they say, don't go, don't apply, you know, don't go there. 
very few think of administration as a way to go. So, you know, when we're thinking about diversity and racism, we have to look at, along the entire pipeline and do the work along the pipeline in order for 10 years from now not to be having this conversation. Yeah, we really hope so. Then 10 years we're not having the same conversation. But as you're saying, it is a up uphill battle. And as Matt's saying, we just have to keep uh, pressing forward. So is there, is there anything else that you feel we need to address? How do we like close this gap? Because as you talk about like that awareness from early on is key, just people understand the different positions um, that's available for you, I think is lacking. So is there like something quickly you can address like an action item you think we can do? Yes, yeah, so one thing I'd like to add is that in this, while we're talking and focusing on the, you know, racism, anti-racism and all of that, there sometimes becomes a tendency of polarizing. And I think we have to pay attention to that too. Because although I experienced racism right up until my last job, <laughs> you know, it just is in the air. There have been white people and brown people that have been instrumental in mentoring me as well. So, you know, I just want to put that out. So you have to then find those individuals. You know, there is a woman named Marie Lund at uh, Home Care who hired me into home care, but also into leading patient care. And I wasn't a clinician. And that's not, that doesn't happen very often in home care. And then later I turned around and hired Stacey Dobb into patient care and she wasn't a clinician. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody that could say she is not an excellent leader. <laughs> so it takes people to break some of those molds and some of those people come from all walks of life. Yeah. So just as young students thinking about that, don't get trapped in particularly people of color, that it has to be a person of color that can help me or mentor me. Um, it's not true. You need to find those individuals um, um, to help facilitate that. You know, I would say, even though later, you know, Bob Bell and I have had all kinds of fight, Bob Bell was also a great mentor, mm -hmm. you know, because when I go over to Bob Bell and Matt and says, look, you know, I'm having trouble in my organization, they responded, say, okay, Camille, what is it? How can we help? How can we work together? How and, you know, have you thought about this? How about this approach? And in areas like technology that I knew nothing about, <laughs> um, I needed help there and I got it. So I just wanted to say that uh, um, as well, because I think it's an important piece to remember as we go along this journey. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, go, Sorry, no, go I was going to say, I think that's very important just in terms of taking those risks and just giving other people opportunities so whether people have, of color, whether people are coming from a different background, because everyone has innate talents that could be transferable to different skills. So Matt, as, even as you answer this question, and as your CEO, new CEO of Ontario Health, like how are your, how's your organization addressing these issues? And what are like the current steps that are being taken? Yeah, thank you. And you know, um, uh, we have this really amazing moment at Ontario Health right now, um, where we are just forming, right? We're merging 21 agencies um, and uh, that means that uh, literally everything that we do inside and out, um, we have a chance to form it um, uh, in a particular way right from the start. Um, so uh, we have identified, um, uh, particularly in the areas of uh, anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism, uh, groups, our own staff, um, and, uh, and uh, we brought in uh, external experts, one of whom happens to be Camille, um, to help us as we build this, how can we build the principles of social justice into our organization? And this is a pretty, you know, on, on the one hand, I feel a little daunted um, and a little under pressure to, to make sure that we take full advantage of this incredibly unique moment in time. It's not only about um, how do we form up Ontario Health, which is hugely important and, and complex and, and needs to be done, but also uh, when we think about uh, we fund $34 billion out to the healthcare system. Um, and so how do we uh, use um, those levers to try to drive change? Um, and is there a way in which we can build in, um, I, I think our model, in my mind anyway, we're a young organization, but in my mind, um, at Ontario Health, we have to first be seen as an, uh, a, 
at um, first principles a leading organization when it comes uh, to these issues. Um, and most importantly, a leading organization when it comes to, the, to a place for safety for all. Um, and that is our role. Um, if we can be that, uh, then hopefully we can also influence through our, you know, we have funding levers and all these other sorts of levers and they're gonna be important and we have to think about how we're gonna use those um, as we go through. But there's also just leading by example on, on how we can uh, move this forward. So an awful lot for us to do. Um, we do have uh, Camille and her colleagues in working with us now. We'll have our first uh, plan um, in the next short while, maybe by the end of October, I think we're hoping to have our first plan. And I call it first plan because I don't, it, it is first, right? We're, we're getting started here. Um, it, it, it will be multi-year, um, but like anything, and when it's multi-year, it needs to be refreshed. It needs to be uh, constantly reviewed as we move forward and make it part of our fiber. And when we think about, you know, uh, just very practical things, when, when my board is looking at my performance, uh, these elements have to be included in that. When I'm looking at my senior team, these elements have to be included in that. So this isn't something that we do on the side of the desk or something that is just kind of nice. This is core. Um, and the most amazing part of this, and, and we're you know, particularly fortunate in healthcare, uh, is that we know that these issues, um, uh, uh, these experiences have direct impact on health. So it's not like we're doing something different and we're like our day job is healthcare and then on the side, we're going to also tackle uh, social injustice and anti-black racism and anti-indigenous racism. No, no, no. <laughs> that's core. That's the inside improving our healthcare system and, and the health outcomes. So very fortunate in that way, in the way that we're bringing it together. So a tall order, probably the person putting the most pressure on me is me um, as we think about how can we take advantage of this moment uh, to try to drive this even further. Well, thank you. We really appreciate your efforts. And we are discussing a pretty um, heavy topic that's been placing a lot of pressure on the marginalized groups of the community and within our health system. But sometimes it's just your perspective, the way you look at things, because pr pressure actually can be a privilege because it presents a challenge and an opportunity to be a catalyst for change. And especially in Vernissage House, we believe in the power of stories. And if you watch any movie or read any book, like the greatest stories have a struggle and conflict. And this year alone, we feel like everything's changing. Um, even before the pandemic, we've, the province was in the midst of restructuring. So in light of this like massive shift, I would love to learn more about your approach in leading a major health transformation and progressing the healthcare system. And you both have experience leading this type of change. So how do you lead these necessary transformations while ensuring equitable healthcare? Sure, um, I, I can maybe start and then, uh, and then turn it over to Camille. Um, so there's everything that you're gonna read in the textbook, and so I'll try not to do too much of the textbook stuff, right? Um, you have to state a vision, uh, you have to communicate, you need to be out front. Those things are all uh, absolutely true. Um, the, the issue for uh, trying to move forward on the kind of change that we're talking about, frankly, uh, for me, is about choices. Um, and this is something I think maybe we don't spend as much time talking about in our strategy textbooks and all that sort of stuff. The, the, the thing I would encourage any of you to think about if you're ever reading a strategic plan or a business plan or any of those sorts of things is, can you tell what choices are being made? Because if you can't tell what choices are being made, then we probably have uh, one of two problems. The one, which is the typical one, is no choices are being made. Um, and if no choices are being made, then you're not really going to succeed in whatever it is. You'll, you'll come out with some vanilla, success will be a vanilla sort of easy thing, not something that actually represents true change. So you should be able to see what those set of choices were. Uh, as a leader, I have to be able to communicate those choices and not be afraid to put out there that we are making a choice. Um, and from time to time, that, that's hard to do. It's easier to put out... The, 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 the shiny object or the thing that we are going to accomplish. Um, but it takes real leadership to also point out what are the things that we are not? What are the things that by doing this, we're not going to be doing the other things? Um, and that's where it gets a whole lot uh, trickier um, because there will be people who, when you describe the big object of the change that you're trying to achieve, they can see themselves in it and they'll just assume themselves there. Um, and sometimes the agenda that they're talking about isn't there. 
Um, and to be fair and to be honest and to be open, you have to uh, say these are the things that we are not going to be able to do. Or at least as you write it, you will be able to see that those choices were actually being made. Uh, when, we, when we think about that, um, I, you know, I just kind of use the word honesty. And I think honesty and trust are words that maybe get thrown around a little too much, um, but are critical to all of this uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I do um, uh, like to think that people are very comfortable coming and speaking with me. Um, and that they know that uh, they can trust that they can spend some time with me to give me their views as we try to move things forward. Um, that is uh, immeasurably important. Um, and so even now today, uh, so, so as a quick example, um, when I started in this role, one of the first things that I did was establish a patient family advisory council, um, which in, in our business is a little bit odd. That's usually something that gets added a little bit later on and oftentimes gets added for all the wrong reasons. Um, for me, it was only in that it's, it's totally selfish. It's not altruistic in any particular way. Um, I just know that in my job, it's going to be very easy for me to lose touch with anything that I'm doing and what's actually happening. And so speaking to and creating a venue of honesty where people feel safe and comfortable to tell me really what's happening as compared to what I hear, and that's not to suggest at all that, that what I hear is any kind of fabricated uh, 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 report. It goes back to what I said earlier, particularly in this job, most of the reports I get are provincial rolled up reports. Um, and so for me to really understand what's going on underneath, I need to talk to the people who are actually down there and living it and patients and, and particularly the caregivers. I mean, they, they're the ones who are really experiencing sort of what's going on in our health system. And so right now, as an example, as we try to uh, uh, address the challenges of COVID and all the things that are happening, um, uh, a couple of my patient and family committee members send me emails on a pretty regular basis, just letting me know what's happening. Um, and one of them just let me know that, you know, in a particular part of Ontario where there is no COVID right now, uh, they have 150 teachers who have been sent home to go get a positive test before you can come back to work whoa, did we ever miss the boat? Like that is absolutely not what should be happening. Um, but through the policies that we put in place at that macro level, that's what's happening. Um, and so, you know, if you can't, you have to build that ability um, uh, to create a safe and trusted relationship where you can spend that time with people who are at the front lines dealing with this stuff and not just always on uh, the more macro uh, things as we change. And for me, it also means that person hopefully, hopefully becomes a delegate for me as well. Um, by me being honest and open with them, when they're out in their circles doing their things, they can speak knowledgeably about what's going on. Um, and coming from them, in many ways, is probably gonna be more credible than it is coming from me, depending on who they're speaking to. So that becomes a, a very important feedback loop as well. Those are just a couple of, of thoughts that sort of beyond what's in the, and the textbooks are right, don't get me wrong, those are all right, um, but a few nuances to support what would be in there. A few things, <clears throat> sorry, that have to become the bedrock of restructuring. One is not same old, same old. Got to be some significant changes that influence how restructuring is, um, is done. So, for example, it means it's not okay for a provider to say, if you want me to do equity and diversity, you have to fund me you are already getting money to treat people. <laughs> You're already getting funds to deliver services. So delivering proper services should not require more money. <laughs> I'm not saying that there is need for in infusion of dollars to increase number of patients, et cetera. But that response, as Matt said about choice, is how the choices usually gets made. I'm already serving this population, this population isn't getting access. If you want me to get this population access, you have to give me more money. So that's something I think we have to pay attention to because there's some code in there. Healthcare will often come out again if Ontario Health makes certain choices about populations that do not currently have access must get access and move funds to make that happen. You can almost, you can predict that the specialty, the specialty services, the high powered services are going to come out to the public to say, 
you know, this, uh, you cannot get this uh, specialty, super specialty service because it's not being funded. Um, and we need more money to do more research to advance this specialty. And we all agree with that. But that is often done at the price of not serving these other populations that don't get care. So what is our first goal? Is our first goal to be world leaders in every super specialty? Wonderful. But if that's at the cost of a good portion of Ontarians not even getting access to good to care, much less good care, then I think it's out of whack. So in terms of restructuring, those are some of the principles <clears throat> that we have to look at. Matt talked about this patient um, uh, advisory council, and I compliment you on doing that. The change we have to make now is the difference between Ontarians and patients, because patients come from who get in. There's a whole pile of us who don't get in, so we're not there. The other thing then is that we have communities who don't have the income, the education, whatever, to come and sit at committees. How do we, what do we put in place to hear their voices? So we need to add to those things. So it's not about not doing what is being done, but it's in restructuring, think of who is missing, what's missing, and ensure their voices get to the table. And there are a number of ways of doing that, which doesn't mean having to sit at a committee ever so often. It can be focus groups, <laughs> community agencies. Um, the other thing too is where does money go? Um, you know, this is not an anti-acute care um, sentiment, but acute care can suck up all the dollars very, very quickly. Community care don't have the same political visibility but that's where most Ontarians get their care. <laughs> and community agencies are the one who know those population best. So how do they get into the fold, get into the, at, at the tables and we address the power imbalance at those tables? Because hospital CEO arrived doesn't mean they are the experts. In a number of cases, they're not actually, um, when it comes to community care or where people live and how people receive care. So those concepts have to be built into the restructuring agenda um, so that we actually get the changes we're going after for Ontarians. Yeah, I think that, I think that was great um, what you added there too. In terms of like empowering the patient itself, like as somebody that served on the patient and family board at different hospitals, um, I was the only young black man there too. And sometimes the work that you did get, it didn't feel like I was really being empowered. So I really commend you, Matt, for just empowering like those patients that were part of Ontario Health. Because I think that's something that's lacking that I know a lot of hospitals are now working towards um, changing that. And maybe just switching gears a little bit in light of the restructuring the health system. So we see like virtual health is becoming big. Um, so there's a lot of changes. So we talk about, Camille, you're talking about adding on to the system. So what advice can you provide for students in terms of future job prospects? And like, where do you envision there will be the greater need? And where do you think we actually need more leaders? So what I would say to students, you know, you're coming into the field and it's a, it's a tough time. COVID is here. People aren't necessarily hiring. How do, they, how do you get onboarded during COVID? <laughs> all of those are the reality but you know youth have a, have a lot of resiliency so <laughs> I have faith um, but the thing I think here is to remember healthcare is quite a wide field and very often when you're in school all the examples you get all the lectures you get everything is around that acute care hierarchy and the only role you can play and the only leadership role you can play is to get into an acute care and rise up um, and I would say rethink that. It's not against that. But some of the time, you know, they're all healthcare. There's community care, there's long term care, there is the ministry, there is policy. And think of all of those as not where your end will be, but in all of those places, you're acquiring new tools for your toolkit. <laughs> so that when you get to another job, you have another experience. <laughs> so I think. Now it's about breaking in 
and doing well and treat all of those entry points as learning opportunities. The other thing I would say there is in those jobs, the attitude should be, this is the best job I have and do the best in the job. And I can say that from experience. My first job uh, at North York General was um, Jim McNabb, who was the CEO, didn't know him, but he came to health admin a few times. And based on the, my participation in the class, he thought I was somebody with potential. You know, Marie Land, when she came to North York General to present, they were just introducing chronic home care. And I had a whole pile of challenges up to her, respectfully done about what they were doing and why they were doing it. That wasn't a negative for her. <laughs> when the job came up, she asked the recruiter to make sure that I applied because it was the thinking process that um, she thought was important. So I think it's important to um, participate that way. The one thing I will say, and this is particular to the kids of color and the young black leaders, what I'm observing is that our parents, in order for us to make it in this country, have told us, have told you how to be respectful, how to be quiet. You're usually in spaces where you're the minority. So you learn to blend in and become invisible. <laughs> you need some mentoring to get over that because nobody is seeing you. <laughs> While, but you have learned how to do that and that's what took you to here. But to go forward, you need to unpackage that um, and take your rightful place. So you have a brain, you have the knowledge, take your place. Um, and that's how, what I would say to young students. Um, I think all young students will struggle. Um, indigenous and black students will struggle even more, but be negatively motivated. The fact that they think you can't, you know, is the reason why you should and you could, and then you can always, you know, in good Jamaican fashion, you go <laughs> after you succeed. So just keep going. That's good. Matt? Hard for me to top that, that's for sure. I, the, uh, and I can honestly say in over 20 years I've known Camille, I've never seen her do that before. So there you go. And, you know, I, I would just maybe echo a couple of thoughts uh, from, from Camille, uh, from Camille's panels. First is, is the idea of the learning curve, right? Um, and try to always stay on the steepest learning curve. That was a bit of, of advice I got very early in, in my career. And worry a little less, you know, uh, Camille and I would both know people who, who would fixate on a particular role, right? And not on a mandate and not on a change, but on a role. Um, and I remember a really good friend of mine, good colleague, he was absolutely fixated on a particular hospital CEO job. Um, he wanted that particular job. And, you know, uh, th throughout life and, and, and even more true, I would say for, for people of color, to, to try to think that, they, the machination of events that have to go on for that one particular job to open up at that one particular time when it makes sense for you to do it and that all the other factors are in place that you would land in that one particular spot, like, it, it's unfathomable. And, and by the way, that this friend of mine is retired now and never did get that job. Um, but like, for me, one of the things that I learned early was what do I care about? Um, what are the things that I want to uh, support or participate in? Um, and it might seem a bit odd and even trite for me to say, but I've never set out to be a CEO. Um, and there's many, many days where I really could be okay not being a CEO. Um, but, you know, in, in, I, I tell a story, and, and again, it was a little bit about uh, Camille, in that a turning point for me um, in my life was um, I was working in um, IT, uh, I was doing information technology at the University Health Network, um, and we had failed for the third consecutive time to try to merge the IT departments between Sunnybrook, UHN, and St. Michael's. And after we had failed three times trying to do that, we did merge the IT between the University Health Network and the Toronto CCAC, of which Camille was the CEO of the Toronto CCAC. And the big difference that I saw was that, um, 
when we would try to merge the hospital uh, IT departments, the clinicians were supportive, but not overwhelmingly so. When we merged the IT between the CCAC and the hospital, um, the clinicians were extremely excited because in the latter scenario, they saw what a difference it was gonna make for patients, for people, right? There weren't that many people, even today, that, that moved between Sunnybrook, UHN, and St. Michael's. But UHN's biggest referral partner was the Toronto CCAC, and the Toronto CCAC's biggest referral partner was UHN. So for me, I was hooked at that moment on integration, on integrated care, on how do we actually bring services to people instead of people going to services. And so since then, I've evaluated every job choice based on what, would, what does that mean to what gives me passion. My passion is to try to integrate care. So does the next job or the next opportunity help me with that? And I stayed at UHN for almost nine years uh, because for the big bulk of them, there wasn't another place that would give me that better opportunity. Uh, I went to the Lynn and discovered it wasn't the place that gave me a better opportunity. I thought it would be, you'd think it was, it had integration in its name, but it wasn't. So I moved to another place. My point is, is that if the uh, best thing that I can do to support integration of the healthcare system is to go and uh, prepare meals at a banquet, that's what I do. Um, because that's, that's the commitment that I make to myself and the passion that we move forward on. Now we all end up, and you guys are nice and young, and you all have uh, your choices along the way. Um, people get married and you start to have kids and you have all kinds of other things and you have to create that balance. Um, but the more that you can stay true to what is the thing that gives you passion, and think about how can you drive that agenda forward as compared to fixating on a particular job or a particular title. And going back to what Camille said at the beginning, titles and leadership are not related. Um, and so you can achieve a whole heck of a lot in, in various other platforms than in, in any particular title. So if you can keep that, and for me, the big issue was keep that learning curve as steep as possible, particularly for all of you who are at the beginning of your career. And lastly, I just want to pick up on the point that uh, Camille has made about acute care and community. Um, and it may sound odd coming from a guy who spent most of his, his career working in acute care. Um, as we see the system start to change, um, and certainly if I have anything to say about it over the next five to 10 years, the, the blending of acute and community will go, those, are, th those are, are models that were built off of decisions around funding and structures that had very little to do with patient care. Um, we have to move away from those, blend it, and move into a care model where we're actually putting, and I know it's all trite, but putting the patient at the front of it, or the person, the resident, the community at the front of it. And by definition, that's going to have to blend community and acute. If, you, if we continue, if five years from now, we have primary care, community care, hospital care, and it's all separate, then we've, we will never get past these hurdles. And what that means for all of you is the opportunity um, to continue to work. And ideally, if, you build this, if we build the system right, you don't have to leave your agency and take employment risk to be able to move through and get experience in these different sectors, um, and which would be a, a tremendous opportunity for folks as we look at how we can pull these things together. Well, thank you so much, Matt and Camille. Like your insight today has been very valuable. I'm gonna definitely have to listen to the podcast when it comes out again, to just get all that information that we gleaned. But can you just put on your big boss hat and just close off with like a direct command, like a call to action, like eat your vegetables because you won't grow. So eating vegetables like a metaphor for seeking discomfort and challenges. So can you just give us a short call to action um, summarizing our discussion today before we go into the Q&A session? Go ahead, Matt. Oh, no, you go ahead, Camille. I can never, you're, you're going to top me. I'm sitting here. I thinking, oh, my Lord, you can't put me in. Camille's like the most inspirational speaker I've ever known. But here we go. Go ahead, Camille. And then okay, it's just, it's just, just a short like sentence. Different. Yeah, just short it's a sentence. short sentence. Because I got instructed as a short sentence, you know, I have to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say young people are organizing, joining, leading, examining their values, and contributing to change. Be part of it. Beautiful. Thank you. Maybe, maybe uh, I'll, 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 I'll give it my best shot um, after that. Uh, my, my best advice in all seriousness is question the experts, listen hard, and believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again, Matt and Camille. And then, as Sarah, as we transition to the Q&A section, 
um, that you'll be moderating quickly. What was, what was your biggest takeaway? And how maybe that relates to a question that we have in the audience right now. Yeah, I think, um, so thank you so much, Matt and Camille. That was really inspirational. And I think very refreshing to talk about really big and important topics this way. I think a lot of the times, um, like Camille, you mentioned, equity gets brought up a lot, but what are we actually doing about it? So it, thank you so much for talking about it. Um, I think my main takeaway um, is doing what you're passionate about. And this came up a lot in the chat, Camille, a lot of uh, people agree with you that um, they had people telling them you should move away from community care to pursue acute care um, because it's more prestigious or whatnot. Um, and Matt, with your advice of doing what you actually care about, I think that's extremely important for young leaders um, rather than chasing a you know, made up dream that someone else made for them, you know, look inwards and see what, what it is that you want to accomplish. Um, and a lot of questions um, in the Q&A have been surrounding the fact that we talk about the fact that we're transforming healthcare, um, and that has been going on for decades. Um, it's not really a new um, topic. So what is it that um, Ontario Health, perhaps the Ministry of Health, or Camille, what is it that's happening in the community that you're seeing that's different this time that's going to make sure we actually achieve our goals rather than letting it just be a blanket statement? You know, government, every change in government, they transform healthcare. <laughs> so that's us. Um, where you have seen the real transformation are people within healthcare who form relationships that, regardless of who the government is, they get the work done and they keep doing the work. And you, you know, there are a number of uh, initiatives like that underway. You know, one, for example, there is Andre Mazzari at UHN. UHN just gave a piece of land to build supportive housing. That's not a big transformation. It's a huge transformation, but that's not a government transformation. That is people in the com in working who then form alliances and begin to work collectively towards the same outcome. So I'm always laugh when we see about government transfer, transformation, you know, home care was home care, then became the CCAC, then become the name. The work hasn't changed. They're still providing care in the community. And collectively, they, they're making some big differences um, as they go through. So I don't have a quick answer for that, but I just think that, just think of transformation as two different ways. The one people make happen and the one government mandate. And when the two come together, like what Matt is trying to do, is powerful. But mm -hmm. you can be transforming all the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's the people who demand change, like the young leaders of today, um, that can persuade governments and larger organizations to actually live up to that change. And so, Matt, what do you think about this? Yeah, so I, I, I had three thoughts. Um, uh, so largely about external factors and external forces to create change. Um, first is, is that um, our tolerance as a society for how our healthcare system operates is waning and waning far more than it has in the past um, on, on all fronts. Certainly, you know, we've spent time today talking about it from uh, particularly an anti-Black and, and anti-Indigenous racism perspective, but truly the tolerance for a, a system that has been built largely around the convenience of the provider um, the, the tolerance for that is waning in ways that I haven't seen before, uh, and I think is good. I, I think related to that is expectations are changing, um, and where I think hopefully it will be good, but it's a little bit um, difficult. And, and I'll just give you the example of, of a change that I think that's changing that in and of itself I think is not so good, uh, but might result in something good. And that is the advent of uh, online access to basically uh, virtual walk-in clinics, right? So we would know them as Maple and a few others. Um, and in and of themselves, I, I, I'm worried about them um, because uh, if you have a credit card, you're getting access to care that you can't get if you don't have a credit card. And by definition, you need a computer to get access to this kind of care. So I worry about that. On the other hand, it's disruption, and I like that. It's disrupting and causing us to think differently. And you know what Maple is selling largely is convenience. They're, they're meeting a the market. They're making a demand. People are fed up with having to wait and, and book an appointment 
and can't get an appointment on a Saturday or an evening and going back to Camille's point, people can't take an entire afternoon off in their, uh, in their job because they've got a 20 minute appointment, but you know that they're gonna, the clinic or whatever is gonna be running behind. So it's disruptive, which is good. Um, it's particular disruption does have me a little bit concerned, um, but that expectation uh, is changing. And lastly, uh, and you know, um, this unfortunately, if, we're, if done not right, is going to exacerbate a lot of our challenges, particularly for our vulnerable communities. The fact is, is that our economic reality of healthcare was already very, very troublesome before COVID. Uh, now, when all this is said and done, um, whenever that's going to be, six months from now, 12 months from now, whatever, there's an economic reckoning that is gonna be something like we've never seen before. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, however it slices, is likely going to affect all of you young leaders and perhaps even the generation behind you, the economic impact of this is going to be so large. But economic realities do push do change. There's no, there's no uh, way around it. And part of our challenge when we think about all of the transformations, uh, you know, the, every government does a transformation and all that sort of stuff. What we will see is that in times of economic uh, uh, largesse, the rate of change slows. Um, you don't have to face more difficult questions because you can paper over them with some cash and we'll just move our way along. Um, and that is not going to be an option for us uh, in the very near future. Uh, and I think that those three things, a lack of tolerance, a higher expectation, and some economic realities are the things I think might be different this time in how we're going to achieve the kinds of changes we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if anything, COVID has really brought our attention to things that really do matter. Um, and while we've always talked about it before, now it's very apparent. Um, and so we have time for one more question today. Um, so. This comes up a lot, I think, um, outside of this discussion, is that a lot of the times it seems like we're putting the burden of addressing racism in healthcare on people of color themselves. Um, and what is it that, um, how can we embed anti-racism in the culture of our healthcare system? What can you guys give one or two practical actions that leaders can do to make sure that they're taking that burden off of people of color and making sure that it's spread amongst everybody? You know, it's not my job as a black person to make white people feel comfortable. That's really is the bottom line and all black people should feel that. After that, depending on the relationship I have is the kind of conversations I have. But I do encourage people to do their own homework. And this is the one place Google works. <laughs> because you can go to Google and find all kinds of information. And from there, you can decide what hooks you and know you go from there will say, give me a list. I can't give you a list because I don't know what your learning needs are, how you learn. Sometimes it's books, sometimes it's articles, sometimes it's videos. But people need to do their own work. Um, organizations need to create space where the Black community, the gay community, all those disadvantaged, the trans community can come together and have conversations. Then they need to have um, training on how to have difficult conversations. And I would say almost every manager now should have on their standard agenda, the first half of the meeting, a, a space for conversation. And that's how you can begin to move that along. Not the end of the agenda where it gets bumped. Thanks, Neil. The only thing that I would add to it as well is, um, and it goes back to a little bit of what I discussed uh, early in this uh, podcast, is that um, how do we, at a, at a decision-making level, which is embedding um, data and information into our processes. Um, and one of our big challenges right now, as we know, is we, we're very poor in developing the data that's required um, to make sure that these issues are in front of us all the time and we understand what is the impact of our decisions on the various different uh, uh, populations. Uh, Camille and others, uh, I like to think myself, have been big proponents of collecting race-based data and other socioeconomic data that will allow us to be able to do this kind of uh, work, to embed it into our decision-making processes. Um, and for me, uh, speaking as, as a white man, what can I do uh, to make this sort of lasting? I would say the same sorts of things that Camille described, but also how when I leave this job, have I embedded decision-making processes that account for these things 
um, as we move forward and how have we changed, which starts with, are we collecting the data, et cetera, all those things in the reporting so that when I'm gone, I'd like to think I'm very committed to all of this and you will be the judges of that at the end of the day. Um, but when I'm gone, somebody else is coming in and they're carrying on because we have built it into our infrastructure the ways Camille has described inside our organization, but also how we're making those decisions outside our organization. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much. Um, you provided a really amazing discussion today and you've left a lot, you've left us with a lot to think about, um, especially that data piece as a health informatics student. I think that should be taught so much more about the importance of the data you're collecting to truly reflect the community that you're serving, like you mentioned, Camille. So thank you so much, Matt and Camille, for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I learned a lot. I know Matthew probably learned a lot as well. For and sure. I'm sure that our listeners did too. Um, and we wanted to thank uh, the Vernissage Health Partners for your support. So thank you to the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation, the Dalalana School of Public Health, and the Associated Medical Services. Um, your support made this event possible and made the podcast possible and we're extremely grateful. And we also want to thank our amazing mentor, Wendy Nelson, uh, for guiding us through this process and giving us a voice to share what we've learned about healthcare leadership. I think that's one of the most invaluable things that Matthew and I have learned so far. Um, and last but not least, thank you to everyone who's listening today and celebrating the launch of the Built to Lead podcast. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the live recording with Matt and Camille and learned something new about healthcare leadership. Uh, our podcast is now live and it can be accessed from all streaming platforms. Just go wherever you usually get your podcasts and type in Built to Lead, the health leaders of tomorrow. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to check out the other episodes because they're now live. Um, and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. Um, just a reminder that this episode with Matt and Camille will be available on October 8th. So if you know anyone who couldn't be here today, uh, they really missed out, but uh, it will be available for them in about a week. So be sure to let them know. Um, so this concludes the episode for today. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Yes, thank you everyone so much. Thank you, everybody.